And now, here's Casey Ingram. Well, happy Wednesday, everybody. Here we are another week, and uh, we're getting really close to the election. Early voting is open, so uh, make sure you get out there. Make sure your voice is heard, and always, uh, you know, vote according to the position and and look at each person individually. So also, there's six amendments on the ballot. I shared on my Facebook page, uh, a friend of mine, Kelly Lehman, thank you, Kelly, had looked up... uh, an organization that went over the Sixth Amendment. So hopefully it's not uh, telling you which way you should vote, but just giving you information so you can decide. And that is on my Facebook page, The Casey Ingram Show, on all those Sixth Amendments because they can be very confusing. Today we're going to cover a couple topics. Uh, I'll give you a brief update on Brightline here in a minute. And then uh, the rest of the hour we're going to spend with uh, retired Colonel Chuck Wynn. And we're talking about a super, super Uh, important topic today and it's stolen valor. You've probably heard the term and I run into people that say what is that? So we're going to talk about that and and why it is important to talk about and hopefully help recognize. Before we get into all that, uh, remind everybody, attention boaters, if you're looking for safe harbor during hurricane season, which is almost over but not quite, a top-notch boat yard to keep your vessel in top, tip-top shape? Look no further than Indian Town Marina. Indian Town Marina is not just your average boat storage facility nestled in South Florida along the Okeechobee Waterway, where a well-protected hurricane hole that savvy cruisers love to call home. They offer a full array of boat yard services or do-it-yourself. Reserve your safe hurricane harborage today and let Indian Town Marina be the ultimate caretaker for your vessel. For more information, call 772 772- Five nine seven two four five seven, or visit IndiantownMarina.com. And just down the street is Indian Town Marine Center, who strives to provide their customers with an efficient and user-friendly location for servicing and storing vessels while still maintaining cleanliness, environmental quality, and safety. They provide dockage, travel lifts, workspace, long-term storage, and other repair and maintenance services, as well as offering a convenient hurricane haul-out program. Indian Town Marine Center is a contractor yard and can provide a list of approved contractors that customers can engage with with no markup or gate fees. Customers are welcome to bring their own contractor provided pre-approval is given before starting work. You can give them a call at 772-597-0800 or look them up online, IndiantownMarineCenterFL.com. And a shout out to the Pearl down in the pocket down in Port Salerno. Uh, fantastic new little waterside setting uh, bar. Very very posh, by the way. So you might want to check that out. It's just opening up and uh, just a new fun uh, place to go and visit here in the area. So promised you a little Brightline update. Uh, yesterday, there was a, another surprise update from the uh, Martin County Board of Commissioners. So it, it's interesting because uh, County Administrator Don Donaldson talked about transparency. Uh, Commissioner Sean Reed in the city of Stewart had made some mentioning or some remarks about uh, lack of transparency as he saw it with the county and city and negotiations with Brightline. And Mr. Donaldson said that transparency is very important to them. And then went on to have a surprise added item, which was creating a RFP for Brightline uh, to have a couple properties. The commissioners ended up deciding a couple properties, the Martin County Fairgrounds and the existing site in Stewart that they've been looking at for the train station. And they mentioned that they were unable to directly give a lease to Brightline because of uh, statute. So they got to put out an RFP, and that's what they voted on yesterday with no um, no public notice. Uh, but certainly it seemed like they knew that they were going to do this. I, it, it seemed like um, it was a very well-received received, uh, RFP approval through the Board of County Commissioners. So I'm sure this RFP will be worded so that Brightline is going to be the only company that will be qualified. I, I heard them throwing out a B for uh, high-speed transportation or high-speed trains. So it it's another way to get around to be able to lease to Brightline land. And that's all fine. We have an agreement, folks, that Martin County said they would go in 50%. What surprises me is the transparency portion of it. Um, Mr. Donaldson says he cares about transparency, but here they go again. They added a Brightline agenda item without notifying the public. So we had no opportunity to weigh in on it. But I also want to remind everybody when it comes to the county, uh, they seem to have a lot of disdain for how Stewart had rescinded the agreement. And 
want to go back to 2018 real quickly because our brethren in fighting uh, at that time all aboard Florida Brightline was Indian River County. And, you know, Indian River County was also blindsided by our Martin County, the current BOCC that sits there today, because they backed out of the lawsuit that we were in alongside Indian River County three days before that lawsuit was to be decided. And I, I can assure you, I, I know folks up in Indian, Indian River County, they were just as blindsided as now Martin County uh, Commission seems to be acting towards Stewart. And um, with that, Indian River County went on with their lawsuit. They got $30 million worth of safety benefits from All Aboard Florida or Brightline. And our county said that uh, they needed to uh, have the settlement agreement with Brightline so that they could give us benefits. The benefits were about half as much as what Indian River County was able to get. Um, unfortunately, that's what Brightline is now reneging on. Uh, they were supposed to do a hazard analysis to go through fencing. I don't know if any of that's been done because now they want to back out on uh, the fencing that they had promised. And we're six years down the line. The fencing should already be done, but evidently it's not. Um, the St. Lucie Bridge was another thing. Our residents and business owners had to come together, make personal sacrifices, and come out of their own pocket to go to Washington, D.C. to lobby <coughs> for an equitable opening of the bridge. They also had to start their own lawsuit because our county commission uh, opted to no longer represent any opposition to the train, and uh, that's part of the agreement. So they will not oppose or challenge or encourage others to oppose or challenge any pending or future future federal, state, or local approval, permit, or authorize our authorization relating to Brightline Project or the financing of the Brightline Project. So they can't oppose any financing, so of course they have to support uh, these grants no matter what the public input is. So if you feel like your voice is not being heard, that's probably a, a good part of it. And unfortunately, the public's never been asked. There's never been a survey, never a ballot issue. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's very frustrating, folks. But I encourage you to still continue to write the commissioners, give them your opinion, uh, even though they said they're not going to, um, you know, oppose any funding or anything with that with Brightline anymore. It's still our land, grant money, still taxpayer money, and certainly our voices matter. So that's really the the quick update. Um, Martin County is moving forward without the city of Stewart. They're putting out an RFP. We'll look at the wording of that when it comes out for Brightline to choose either the fairgrounds or the city of Stewart, and then we'll see how it, it goes from there. And I think that they're trying to also apply for the current grant uh, that's available out there, of course. So there we go. And and just a side note, um, for, for our county administrator, noticed your yellow tie. We noticed that uh, that was there supporting the, the yellow. So um, here we go, folks. Now we're going to move on to the rest of the hour, and I have Colonel Chuck Wynn in the studio with me today. Again, it's such an important topic. Uh, Chuck Wynn is a retired Army colonel, a native of Grand Rapids, Michigan. After graduating from high school in Coventry, Rhode Island in 1967, he attended college for a year. He was drafted as a private in 1968, and after serving briefly as an acting sergeant, he was commissioned an infantry second lieutenant from OCS at Fort Benning in 1969. He served in Vietnam as an advisor to South Vietnamese irregular tactical units before leaving active duty. While attending Rhode Island College on the GI Bill, he was active in politics and was also a legislative aide. He earned a BA in political science and history while remaining in the National Guard. For six years before re-entering active duty, Chuck was a member of the Massachusetts National Guard's full-time support force. He held numerous infantry company command and tactical level intelligence and operational staff assignments. During the 80s, Chuck was the commandant of cadets at Tuske Tuskegee, right? Tuskegee, Tuskegee. there we go, Tuskegee, Tuskegee. <laughs> University, Alabama. His senior level strategic planning assignments in the Pentagon included the Department of the Army staff developing <coughs> unit training strategies, force readiness policies, and legislation. Chuck also represented the Office of the Secretary of Defense on the Interagency Working Group for Combating Domestic Terrorism Involving Weapons of Mass Destruction and on the Deputy Secretary of Defense Task Force that developed the Organization for Defending Against Domestic 
WMD terrorist attacks established by Presidential Decision Directive 62. For two and a half years, he served with the U.S. Forces Korea headquarters in Seoul. He holds a master's degree from Troy University and is a graduate of the U.S. Army War College. Chuck lives in Stewart with his wife, the former Lynn Carroll Scott. They met in Washington, D.C., where Lynn had a career as an association executive. Since the military, Chuck was a member of the campaign organizations of former U.S. Congressman Catherine Harris, former Congressman Duncan Hunter's 2008 presidential bid, and former U.S. Senator Bob Smith's organization. He has a national VIP military surrogate for uh, Senator Ted Cruz's 2016 presidential campaign. He is a member of the U.S. Army Officer Candidate School of Hall of Fame, Phi Alpha Theta Historical Honor Society, and the Tuskegee University Chapter of Alpha Phi Omega Fraternity. His military awards include two Legions of Merit, the Defense Meritus Service Medal, three Meritorious Service Medals, the Joint Service Commendation Medal, three Army Commendation Medals, two Army Achievement Medals, and the Good Conduct Medal, Army Reserve Components Achievement Medal, National Defense Service Medal with Star, the Vietnam Service Medal, Korean Defense Service Medal, Humanitarian Service Medal, Armed Forces Reserve Medal, Republic of Vietnam Campaign Medal, Republic of Vietnam Cross of Gallantry Unit Combat Infantry Badge, Parachutist Badge, Department of the Army Staff Badge, and the Office of the Secretary of Defense Badge. Thank you, sir. God bless you. Um, what, what a career. Well, I was paid for it. No need to thank me. Yeah. Well, we do. Uh, honestly, we, we absolutely do. You have a tremendous amount of experience. And um, Chuck reached out to me a, a while ago when there was a stolen valor uh, issue that had come about and said, you know, the media never highlights these things. They never say anything about it. And so I offered him, I said, let's come on the show and talk about it. So let's start out with the definition of stolen valor first. Okay, well, stolen valor is deliberately making false claims about military service. Uh, typically, this includes a fraudulent claim about having participated in combat operations, having been awarded prestigious decorations or awards for combat heroism, or actually wearing awards that you've never been, uh, that you've never earned. Now, this can range from imposters who never saw a day of service to exaggerated uh, claims of duties or uh, assignments by people who actually did put some time in the military. Now, uh, making false claims of military service that result in a personal benefit or financial gain is a criminal offense. Most instances usually fall short of that, though. Uh, now, it's not uncommon to read about prosecutions of veterans who fraudulently collect, who get caught fraudulently collecting VA disability compensation. Typically, it's for post-traumatic uh, stress when it's been discovered that they never even served in a combat zone. And uh, typically, they'll either forge their DD-214 or they'll just um, get some civilian uh, shrink at the VA to buy a story about how they're uh, their uh, secret missions were never recorded on their uh, forms, but uh, it happens all too often. Now, several years ago in Georgia, there was a ranking uh, law enforcement officer in the uh, Atlanta area who was caught having forged his DD-214, which was essentially the reason why he had been uh, promoted to some uh, through the ranks to a senior level position within a sheriff's department. I think he was a uh, captain uh, when they finally caught up with him. And then uh, another recent example was in Rhode Island, there was a female uh, former Marine, uh, very articulate, very well spoken. Uh, she ended up receiving a year in prison because she was drawing a big VA compensation, wow. VA disability check. And it turned out she had never served in combat or uh, uh, experienced any of the uh, conditions that would have merited such a, di a disability award from the VA, but she had also risen to the top position in the state of Rhode Island's Council of Veterans. So it's, it's really embarrassing sometimes when uh, those things uh, happen. 
Why? They, they, they do, and I want to go in in yeah. depth and all that. There's a lot yeah. of things we want to cover, and I, yeah. I wanted to step back one second because we're going to really go into depth with the stolen valor. I, I just wanted to give folks an overview of yeah. what that is. But there, there's a couple of topics we're going to be covering here today. Yeah. And, you know, another is Memorial Day. Every year we have a parade here in Stewart, and communities around the country have a parade, and it, it should be a solemn occasion. And I I, I don't know that everybody realizes that, Chuck, and it was something you wanted to touch on. So I, I want to touch on the Memorial Day parades, and you have a little bit of history here locally of trying to mm -hmm. share what the meaning truly is, and it, it's kind of fallen on deaf ears. Well, uh, kudos to you, Casey, for recognizing uh, the issue. Uh, this was back in May, and I'd like to uh, tip my hat to Eric Miller for making the video of this disgusting spectacle that uh, results in a carnival-like atmosphere every Memorial Day that is directly facilitated by the city of Stewart and also enabled to a lesser degree by the county government. Um, America's sons and daughters do not go to war or make the other sacrifices involved in serving in the armed forces as Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, conservatives, or progressives. They do it as Americans. That's how they've always served, as Americans. Memorial Day is a solemn national holiday for the purpose of honoring those, the memories of our fallen uh, heroes, and also the memories of the men and women who have served in our armed forces, who have uh, pass from the scene. Now, Memorial Day services must be conducted in a dignified, solemn, nonpartisan manner. A, uh, a parade should be modeled on something you would see at Arlington National Cemetery, either at a, a military funeral or a commemorative event. A commemorative event. These parades are scaled down solemn events consisting of color guards and ceremonial units. Uh, they aren't for the purpose of promoting local civic organizations, promoting local uh, political parties, promoting local businesses, showing off your antique used cars. Uh, they're, not the they're not the occasion for people to uh, march in T-shirts that promote their favorite candidates. Um, these are supposed to be solemn, nonpartisan, dignified events. Now, if political candidates want to go to the barbecues and cookouts at the veterans' posts afterwards and politic and collect their signatures, that's fine. That kicks off the beginning of the summer. But the actual Memorial Day observance, observances are solemn, nonpartisan events if you wouldn't do it at Arlington National Cemetery, you shouldn't do it at a Memorial Day event. That's um, really a good rule of thumb there. If you're questioning uh, what your participation in the parade or what you're seeing, if it's not going to be going through Arlington Cemetery, it, yeah. it is a very solemn and honorary Yeah, the, the, the participants in any type of parade associated with Memorial Day should be the veterans organizations with their, with their honor guard or color guard units, uh, some patriotic organizations provide um, honor guard type units like the Daughters of the American Revolution, Sons of the American Revolution. Uh, our Reverence Motorcycle Association is a veterans group that provides honors and escorts at funerals. That, that would be appropriate. Now, it's also appropriate for, you know, law enforcement or first responder organizations to provide a ceremonial marching unit, but not blaring sirens Pomp from not, not blaring sirens from a fire truck or blaring sirens from a police cruiser now there are occasions there are appropriate occasions for that N november 11th veterans day that's the day you do that kind of thing but even still on veterans day it should be a nonpartisan event now back in 2014 the Martin County Veterans Council developed some very good guidelines on how to conduct these events. And at the beginning, I made a strong statement against the city of Stewart and the county. Whenever I've raised this issue to the city or the county, I always get referred to the Veterans Council. 
The Veterans Council is a private organization. They don't have enforcement powers. The only way you're going to keep the yahoos out of these ceremonies is to make it a city ordinance that can be enforced by local law enforcement. So, Chuck, um, and by the way, folks, thank you for for uh, tuning in. Jerry, appreciate you tuning in while you're out on the road. Jackie, uh, making a comment about uh, Bright Line and the Bridge, folks. Uh, you can call into the studio, 220-9788, 220-9788, or I'm watching comments here on Facebook. We can talk about all the different topics, so if you have a question or comment, uh, definitely uh, please uh, type it out or call into the studio. I'd love to hear from you. But, Chuck, tell us a little bit. You, you have tried to go to the city commission in the past, and I don't know if it was the county. You, you've tried to reach out, but to no avail. So we have new commissioners that were just elected, by the way, so it might be a good time to re-reach yeah. out and maybe engage some folks here that are listening to do the same. Well, I've been informing these people for the last uh, two-plus decades, mm. uh, incumbents, former uh, commissioners, uh, it's a public record. Uh, they kind of backed off when I was active politically in one of the local political parties because my presence was a bit intimidating and people right. were reluctant to challenge me. But I've, I'm not actively engaged in politics anymore. So, uh, you know, a lot of people just, uh, you know, it's difficult to take on some of these uh, sacred cows. And uh, I think we should note that when uh, Eric made that video of that last spectacle uh, back in May, we decided to do this show after the election because this is a nonpartisan event and we didn't want to be, I didn't right. want to be charged with uh, trying to attack some uh, person of The local out. elections, yeah, right. Yeah, it has nothing to do with the local election. However, every election year, you always see People slipping in to promote their political campaign. Now, if they're elected officials, yes, they should attend these events as dignified guests, as as dignified guests in uh, solemn, quiet dignity. Dignity, not marching around and waving. Or uh, no, they should go to the ceremony after the Memorial Day parade. They want to march in parades. They should do it on Veterans Day. Now, if the if the people that love these parades, want to have a summer event, they can do it on Armed Forces Day, the week before Memorial Day, or the 4th of July. Nobody's uh, nobody's saying they shouldn't do these things. It's just not appropriate to do it on Memorial Day. For that particular, yeah. for that particular day and event and what it means. And again, I think a lot of folks, and myself included, yeah. were not aware of how solemn that day should be treated, and, and, and I get the respect. I, I now that I've spoken with you and I've heard your your feelings behind it, I get it. This yeah. is a Memorial Day. This is for our soldiers that have fallen. There's nothing yeah. nothing to celebrate there. So, Chuck, it just seems like such a reasonable request. And the, the, the Veterans Association put out a guideline. Why is there no action on it from the city or county? Because they all benefit from um, – not all of them. There are, there are some that uh, – Advertising there. There are some that just attend the ceremony in quiet dignity. Uh, Sir Heard comes to mind. Uh, Ed Campy always attended in a quiet dignity. Until this year, Doug Smith used to, but this year he marched, you right, know. But right. uh, I was kind of dis disappointed to see that. But uh, 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 the school the school board members, you know, they just attend the event. They don't, you know, uh, right. hope, hopefully they won't be marching in future uh Memorial Day parades. Let them do it on Veterans Day. So, yeah. so there you have it, folks. Um, that's just something that uh, Chuck wanted to pass out about really the true meaning of Memorial Day, and it is honoring our fallen veterans that have fought so hard for all the rights that we enjoy today. Chuck, uh, of course, I, of course, they can do that on uh, November 11th and could, showcase right. themselves. Of course, it'll be after the election, and they won't. You know, it's not going to right. benefit them like it will in May when they're Ahead organizing the a campaign. Yeah. And, and Chuck's right. We absolutely did wait to do this show till after the election because we didn't want it to be um, yeah. a, a topic of why we were bringing it up. You're bringing it up yeah. because you're passionate about it, and it's, yes. just, it's education, and we're asking the city and the county officials, let's consider this. And folks can reach out to them, too, and email them, right, and say, Oh, absolutely. Just, uh, can we put send some guidelines? An, just send them an email on the public website. Um, and, uh, again, you know, uh, some of them, it's an oversight. Um, 
they don't know any better. Even some that I support have done it. Uh, so I'm not trying to single anybody out. Right. But, uh, right. It's time to fix it. And Jackie brought up, she said, plain and simple, it's called respect. Yes. And that's absolutely respecting, what it is. Respecting the memory of our honored fallen comrades is what it's all about. 100%. Yeah. All right, Chuck, thank you. We're going to head back to the Stolen Valor uh, issue. And I that's a real, real tough one because you see it a lot. And we're even, we've heard it being brought up through this presidential yeah. election right now in relation to Tim Waltz. And I want you to talk a little bit about that because you, it was one of the notes that you gave to me ahead of the show. Okay, let me, uh, let me address this from purely a professional military's per- perspective. Tim Waltz served honorably. He put 24 years in the National Guard. And these National Guardsmen and women make a great sacrifice. It's not their main source of income. It's a part-time job, but they stand ready to be called up for uh, frequent uh, deployments to include combat zones. So that's how the uh, two recent wars we've been in have been fought. And um, Tim Walt served honorably for 24 years. He was mobilized uh, twice, uh, deployed to Europe twice. Um, and it's very unfair to call him a coward because he had an opportunity for uh, – he had a good shot at a congressional race, and he decided to retire be, rather than get called up again, and that where, where you get sent is the lo- is the luck of the draw in the military. So the fact that Tim Waltz decided to retire is not a stolen valor offense. You know, he'd served 24 years, he'd done two mobilizations and deployment, and he had to put his civilian career first. Now the problem with Waltz is he didn't just retire when his time came up. He had re-enlisted for six years as a condition of being promoted into that highly competitive command sergeant major position and another uh, and uh, another condition of his being promoted into that position was that he complete the sergeant majors academy which is a college level one-year resident program or three years if you do it by distance learning non-residents now even his demotion for administrative purposes because conflicts with his civilian job prevented him from completing the education requirements. There's no shame in that. Where the stolen valor issue comes in with Waltz is during the 12 years he was in Congress, he deliberately misrepresented himself as having served in combat. He allowed himself to be introduced as a combat veteran. I follow military and veterans legislation very closely and I always thought he had served in Afghanistan the way he used to package himself. Now that's the stolen valor issue. Falsely claiming an honor that he didn't earn and that there was no reason for it. He had a perfectly honorable military record. Uh, We had a Republican U.S. Senate candidate. I want to be nonpartisan, bipartisan about this. This is both parties. It's Mm -hmm. happened on both sides. In Florida, quite a few years back, we had a U.S. Senate candidate got caught for something very similar that wrecked his uh, Senate campaign in that uh, it's not a question of putting somebody down because they didn't serve in a combat zone. Not at all. All service is important. Every job is important. It's just you don't. Uh, claim credit that she didn't earn. Another recent example in Ohio, two years ago, there was a Republican congressional candidate made it through the primary, and he got exposed for lying about having served in Iraq in combat, where where he had uh, served in Kuwait, and um, Mm -hmm. he lost the general election. This year he was trying to run again, and this time, fortunately, he didn't win the primary. Uh, And then you have, getting back to being bipartisan about this, you had Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut. The first time he ran for the Senate, he misrepresented himself as a Vietnam veteran. And when the facts came out, he was was a Marine Corps reservist that had only served on active duty for six months during that era. Now, no no shame in that. That's an honorable way to serve. I mean, that was a deterrent against a uh, Soviet... Uh, a war with the Soviets in Europe. Mm-hmm. But 
you don't um, the dishonor is falsifying your service, not uh, how you serve. Right, right. Yeah. And you're seeing that quite a bit. Uh, Joan Eason, appreciate you tuning in. Uh, back to the Memorial Day Parade for a, m a moment. I'm high and tight in Memorial Day Parade. I'm in flip-flops and shorts with my uniform shirt and cover on Veterans Day. Veterans Day is for those of us that came home. Memorial Day is a sacred time for reflection on the ultimate sacrifice. Amen. Amen. That's exactly what you're saying. Um. Another thing you wanted to bring up, too, was uh, spouses, and you had brought up uh, you know, Senator McCain and, and uh, the late Senator McCain, uh, prime examples of uh, what is a true military spouse? What well, is mili it? let's talk about military families. Being in a military family includes, entails the experience of having uh, gone through the uncertainty and the anguish of not knowing what's going to happen to your deployed loved one. Now, a second or third spouse who met the even a distinguished combat veteran years after they served in the military, they never experienced that. People like in, the, in Senator McCain's case, the people who uh, went through the anguish and uncertainty all those years he's a POW, that was his first wife and family, Cindy and... Uh, the uh, daughter, Megan, didn't come along until after he was uh, retired from the Navy. and uh, So hardly a, a traveling military spouse. Yeah, so th you know, that, that's an example. Uh, another thing is uh, you know, a Gold Star family member is somebody who lost a blood relative in combat, somebody who lost a father, a mother, a spouse, a son, a daughter, not somebody who is a descendant of somebody who served in the military 50 or 80 years ago, great Americans though they were, you know, right. th that's not the same thing as, as being a, a Gold Star member. Right. And uh, uh, somebody who, um, you know, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of organizations that uh, have legacy members and they're great patriotic organizations auxiliaries mainly of the uh, chartered congressional the congressionally chartered veterans organization organizations like the VFW the Legion they have auxiliary members who have blood relatives that served and they do a great job promoting the memory uh, of uh, of the services and right. sacrifices of our uh, military heroes it's weird you're taking advantage of, of taking credit of a, a, a title or um, I don't know what's the best way to say it, but a, a service yeah. designation when you really well, didn't do that. I'll, I mean, I, I've been I've been challenged quite frequently by those types, and uh, I mean, I'm the son of a two war combat veteran, the uh, grandson of a World War One veteran who got gra who got drafted about a year or so after he got off the boat from Poland, yeah. and uh, my dad was even a POW in Korea for 34 months. So you know, if you want to play the military family card with me, I can play that too. Play it all day long. But uh, <laughs> one thing that really got you was the media in general. They really don't do their background work on trying to find out if it's truly a veteran or not. And we mentioned this form. It's the DD-214 form. Um, you showed me yours. Yeah, it's the DD-214 is the report of separation from military service. It's the official document that attests to somebody having served in the in the armed forces, it shows uh, any combat service, any all your awards and decorations, your military decorations. Usually, only your last unit of assignment shows up, but you can get a pretty good snapshot of uh, somebody's service from a DD-214. And uh, a big problem with stolen valor is a lot of people don't vet. Um, vet those claiming military service too well. The hometown news back in April ran a story about a former Army specialist who had claimed that sh she went on an honor flight to the Vietnam Memorial in D.C. and she was 68 years old, which is too young, but she claimed she'd served, uh, she enlisted in the Army in 73, that she's finally bringing closure to the guilt of having called friendly fire from remote locations onto U.S. troops. Well, 
I contacted the hometown news. My intent was not to call this person out by name. She obviously has serious psychological problems, but I pointed out we didn't have any troops in Vietnam after Janu- after March of 1973 under the terms of the Paris Peace Accords. It's impossible for her to be so there. So it was impossible for, to, for her to have been there. And um, I also cited my degree in history and also my military education and my own background as a boots-on-the-ground infantryman in Vietnam. Sent a letter to their editor, sent a letter to the reporter who wrote the story. Never heard back from them. And this is the kind of thing that keeps going on. And I think, too, I, I saw that, uh, Chuck, you might need to help me here for a yeah. second, but they're, they're, they're interviewing in Washington, D.C., a lot of people that come up there, a lot of veterans that yeah. come up there. And it gets – it's part of the um, – I want to say the congressional record, but they have it in the, I think, the Library of Congress. Oh, the, the Veterans History Project. Yes. And um, this person was actually interviewed on that. That's she been, was. Yes. Yes. So, you know, the, the level of somebody not checking someone's background out is, yeah. is far and wide, and everybody should have the DD-214, correct? I mean, uh, there's no reason uh, yes, not to. Yes, everybody has a DD-214. There's no such thing as a classified combat decoration. If you're awarded a combat decoration as a result of a heroic act on a classified mission, the citation isn't going to mention the mission you were on, but there's going to be a record of the high-level decoration you received in your official records. Now, sometimes an award doesn't catch up with you until after after you leave the service. In that case, you'll have a copy of the orders and the certificate and Normally, when you, when that happens, they'll give you a DD-215, which is an amendment of the 214. If you um, lose your DD-214 or 15 through it's very, time? It's, it, it, you can get them online very quickly okay. uh, nowadays, especially uh, a lot of times funeral homes are very good at expediting getting them for survivors okay. for the um, VA funeral veterans, uh, funeral benefits. Now, most st- stolen valor claims don't really result in criminal prosecution. There was a there was a stolen there was a first stolen valor act uh, that Congress passed over ten years ago that maybe it was fifteen, but it, it criminalized wearing unauthorized decorations. The Supreme Court ruled violation of the First Amendment right to free speech. So. In most instances, unless you have actually gained a financial benefit from it as a direct result of your claim, your fraudulent claim, it's not a criminal offense. It's just a very serious uh, breach of ethics and integrity to do that. Now, uh, when that happens in a veterans organization, normally the veterans organization expels the member. Now, now you you know there was there was a commendable example of reporting about twenty years ago. There was somebody around here. He used to, he, I'm not going to mention the name. The guy claimed to be a retired Green Beret lieutenant colonel. He's on the Veterans Council. He used to present bronze stars and purple hearts to old World War II veterans that get long delayed awards at the ceremonies, and. Shortly after Jessica Lynch was captured in Iraq, I used to uh, go down to uh, the local CBS affiliate as a commentator okay. during during the ground war when uh, the 2003 eva- invasion of Iraq. And when the first POW was uh, captured, I said, well, I know my dad. He lives in Tarpon Springs. So they go, no, do you know anybody here locally? And I go, yeah. And I referred him to this person. This person went on camera. And somebody, th- that ex-POW group of Vietnam ex-POWs is a tight-knit group. Somebody saw the interview locally. He was a Vietnam POW, called the station, and the reporter, her name was Deborah Boxty, she followed up and got the documentation. And a few months later, she came over to the house and showed it to me. And I wow. said, you got him. The guy was a veteran. He had served in Vietnam. No, no awards for valor. He wasn't even, you know, he claimed to be, be a Green Beret, not even jump school, not even airborne qualified with the basic wings you get to impress civilians like I have, you know. Right. The, uh, well, it's so tough. I actually had somebody, I uh, was talking about this show yeah. ahead of time, and, and she said, 
she goes stolen Val-, she yeah. hadn't heard of what's stolen valor didn't know what it was and then she said but um you know how do they get clothes or the the military gear that looks oh. like they're oh you know, it's a veteran. It, anybody can buy that stuff you can buy a uh, you can buy a medal online uh you can buy bogus certificates online the actual do- the thing to look for is the document or the official awards certificate just having the medal doesn't uh, prove anything and if you were awarded the medal it'll show up on a dd-214 or a dd-215 because when my dad got a 60 year overdue purple heart um right. they amended his dd-214 60 years after, or no this is like maybe 50 years after he'd retired from the military to uh, close the record wow so uh, I see Tom uh, Billington uh, tuned in. He said, uh, Brightline belongs in Fort Pierce. We'll change the topic here. Secondly, you know, Tom, we've never had a survey, never a ballot question ever about whether or not we wanted a station or where it should go here in Martin County. Uh, this is all being decided by the county commission. And as you know, I am screaming out there, we don't have enough public input. So uh, for those that agree with you, there's been no opportunity to voice that opinion. And all I can hope is that perhaps the county would at least put out a survey for residents that want to participate and that they can only answer once so that, uh, and it has to be somebody that lives in the county. So it's those of us that it matters to. So, um, but I, but I agree. Um, we should have that input. So the other thing, we'll move back to Stolen Valor mm-hmm. that we see a lot is there's a lot of homeless veteran issues, and that's something you wanted to touch on with us. Yes. Um, the homeless veterans issue is highly exaggerated and exploited. Everybody who, ser- who since the late 70s, early 80s, anybody who processes through a um, – a military entrance processing station gets fed into the VA database. So if you're somebody who gets sent home after a week of basic training, you'll still show up in their database. Um, The homeless veterans uh, shelters that HUD finances don't require legal veteran status. All you have, you just have to show up in the VA database and Something like 90% of the people who serve in the armed forces get honorable discharges or general discharges under honorable conditions. Fine, that entitles you to all veterans' benefits, a very generous range of programs. For example, if somebody who's an honorably discharged veteran um, has a substance abuse program uh, problem, they have, they have very generous programs. If you're hospitalized or in residential treatment, for 30 days or more, you temporarily temporarily draw 100% disability pay until you complete the program. The people who aren't covered are those who those who get out with uncharacterized discharges. These are typically people who can't complete initial entry training, or they're separated for unsuitability, and they haven't served the minimum amount of time required by law to entitle you to veteran status and then there's a small percentage maybe three percent who are separated with bad conduct or dishonorable discharges as a result of a court martial sentence now if you if you get a general discharge or a from a court if you get a dishonorable discharge or a bad conduct discharge from a court martial it's usually for a an offense that would be the same type of offense you would uh, be convicted in a civil court for. Murder, theft, robbery. The majority of people, for example, at the Leavenworth Military Prison at Fort Leavenworth, these aren't people that stood up to their bully officers and refused to obey orders. These are people that are in there, usually for sexual offenses with a minor. You know, those are the, you know. Yeah. And, Mm. you know, people uh, often accuse me of being uh, a bully, and I like to... uh, point out you don't understand unless you've been in a position of command and that commanders have to take care of their troops I had a lot of troops that were great troops I never had the time to write up the awards they should have gotten they were good solid performers because that's optional your problem people the people that you have to process out with these uncharacterized discharges take up all kinds of time and so you have all kinds of people 
that really were great soldiers, put in a lot, you know, put in a lot of effort. They were 100 percenters. They never got the recognition they deserved. It wasn't because they were just mediocre. It was because they're, they probably separated or were in at a time where their units had a lot of personnel issues that uh, took the time of their chain of command to resolve. Again, we're speaking with uh, retired Army Colonel Chuck Wynn. And, Chuck, I appreciate you coming yeah. in here today. This is a, a, a really timely show with Veterans Day that's yeah. coming up, but also something, as you know, we wanted to talk about the Memorial Day parade, um, yeah. the, the festivities that shouldn't be happening that go around with that. And uh, there's a lot of issues here to, to talk about. And another one that you mentioned was the abuse of the VA disability system and that the Government Accountability Office studies found that over two-thirds of VA disability compensation payments are for conditions having no causal relationship to performing military service. Yes. If a line of duty injury or a line of duty, the definition of that means it happened to you while you were on active duty, uh, and you weren't in an AWOL or desert, deserter status. So if you throw out your knee sliding into second base, and years later you file a disability claim with the VA, when your disability claim goes into the hopper, that's going to be in the same stack with those in a combat wound. And when you get into the VA, that's the epitome of equality of outcome regardless of effort or uh, sacrifice in that okay. uh, they don't triage patients based on the cause of their their condition. It's based on uh, the severity of what the condition is. Now, one of the abuses of the VA is if you have a small v if you have a small disability and you have a substance abuse problem, you can get a secondary bis disability. And a lot of people with high disabilities from the VA have um, only a small disability for something that might have had some causal relationship to being on active duty, not a combat wound, but sliding into second base, hemorrhoids, complications during pregnancy, uh, things like that. And then if they develop substance abuse problems, they can get up to 100 percent. And 100 percent VA disability, that, that can be 30, that's close to 40,000 a year now, depending on whether you have uh, dependents or not, plus all the other benefits that go with it in that no, don't get me wrong. Somebody who gets injured in a training accident, somebody who, uh, you know, Deserves they, they, they sure. deserve it just as much as somebody who got killed and got injured in combat. Nobody's saying that stateside or peacetime service is not important. It's very important. The Cold War is a great example. A lot of it, it, was, it was tough duty serving in Germany during the Cold War, especially in a combat arms unit like a tank unit or a mech infantry unit. Well, it, unfortunately, there's just a lot of yeah. abuse in the system, and I guess you yeah. can say that for a lot of different areas, but it's just something yeah. to be aware of. And Well, I, again, uh, in, in this, abu uh, this abuse of the VA system, uh, you have a lot of bogus charities, or not bogus, but charities that are pursuing questionable objectives. For example, when you hear these, are, we're helping veterans who, can't, who don't get services through traditional channels. They're going after the, the people who didn't, qualify for veteran status people don't realize that, that when you when you allow this stuff to happen you're uh, putting people that really need those services the the uh, the combat the combat wounded the operationally injured the people with an agent orange those are the people who should be getting the prop in burn pit uh victims from the uh gulf and afghan wars uh, Gulf War Syndrome, those are the people who should be getting the priority of treatment uh, and benefits from the VA, not these uh, people with very marginal periods of low-risk uh, service. Sounds like it might be something that's a little tough to cut through the red tape to find out which issues are valid and, and which are being um, you know, used to try and gain more services through the VA. I mean, uh, it, it's a tough... Part of the problem was... Uh, was uh, are with PTSD and Agent Orange, especially Agent Orange, you used to have to document that you operated in an area where it was actually used. Now you just have to have service. If you serve there, it's it's assumed. It's that. assumed, and that uh, so that's filling up the know, system even more too. Or or PTSD you used to have to document that you were actually involved in a traumatic event. 
that's no longer a wow. requirement. If you can convince, if you can convince a sh civilian shrink or social worker at the VA, oftentimes you can get the uh, PTSD claim. And that entitles you to all the benefits, and there yeah. you have it. And 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 and, and, that, and those guys aren't ever going to be. Uh, like somebody who served in a rear area in a combat zone that comes up with a claim like that, they're never going to be prosecuted for stolen, you know, for false claim because they actually were in a combat zone and under the loose criteria that's in effect, they made it through the system. So for the homeless veterans, as we see that a lot. The There's true, a place for them. Oh, absolutely. We need to facilitate getting those guys into uh, into treatment through the, through the VA program. So there Absolutely. is a program available. And, and the objective is to mainstream them, get them back into the mainstream society. We don't need communities with hostels that are like barracks, right. uh, halfway houses. Don't need those. In the, the overwhelming majority of veterans reintegrate into civilian life. Again, we've been speaking with yeah. Chuck Wynn, and we just have a couple minutes left. And, Chuck, I, I need to talk about you're an author as well. Tell us a little bit about that real quick. Well, yeah, I, I recently um, wrote a, um, all right, five years ago, I wrote my first one. I've been saying the second one's on the way, but. Uh, it is. <laughs> I, I wrote it um, as a, as historical fiction to protect the privacy of the individual everyday characters that are involved in it. But it's, a, it's also a look at the social, political, and military history of the 60s and 70s. And the ones I'm working on now, the one I'm working on now is uh, from Jimmy Carter up to uh, 1984 uh, on the verge of Re Reagan's re-election. Fantastic. Yeah. So, and you can find your books on Amazon. Yeah, True Tales of the Diwee is the name of the book. And all the proceeds go to a scholarship fund at Indian River College that I set up for veterans in memory of my dad. They don't go to me. It's fantastic. Chuck Wynn, I have enjoyed our hour with you today. Yep. Appreciate you coming in. And, and folks, uh, hopefully you can help out, especially uh, with the Memorial Day Parade, as you go out there and you see, you know, pompous cheering and sirens blaring. Remember really what it's about. It's honoring those that have fallen uh, to protect our country. And, and hopefully you can whisper something in the ear to, well, you have to whisper it. Let, let the city officials know that it needs to be a solemn occasion and it's important that we honor our fallen veterans in that way and uh you know finally again with the with the bright line uh well i'm sure we'll have more shows on that we'll follow the county commission commission at martin.fl.us is their email and uh, i urge you to uh, give your your opinion whether it's for or against i don't care it's it's good to put your opinion out there um i just at the beginning of the hour covered it a little bit uh, a little shocked that they're they're so uh, upset that City uh, Stewart rescinded when they backed out of a, a lawsuit very abruptly when Indian River County was our brethren as well, and Indian River County felt much the same way. So, um, you know, let's let's look at our total actions of this entire deal, and uh, we'll follow it through. See if we can just get them to hold to the settlement agreement. That's all I'm asking for personally. So, Chuck Wynn, it has been a pleasure. Stolen Valor, the Memorial Day Parade. Yeah, and anybody who wants to whine about me, I'll send them an autographed picture of me wearing sergeant stripes back in my sergeant days. <laughs> so there you go, and you can find Chuck Wynn. Uh, Jackie, Jackie Picanis said, thank you so much for your service, and we all say that. And uh, Kathy Peterson, Stewart pushed it. County people should not have to put the failure. It will be. That's about Brightline. You're absolutely right. Thank you so much. Again, Chuck Wynn.